It brings me joy to be able to tell everybody my experience with survivor's guilt, with single ventricle, and one of the older single ventricles at a Pittsburgh Children's Hospital. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna. I am Anna Jaworski and your host. I'm also a heart mom to Alexander, who was born with a single ventricle heart and who is 26 years of age. He is the reason I started this podcast. I'm very excited about today's show to feature a special heart warrior. Today's show is entitled Classic Fontan Survivor and Post-Cardiac Transplant Survivor. Leslie Castro is a 47-year-old former single ventricle patient from Pennsylvania. She was born with tricuspid atresia, pulmonary stenosis, and multiple other heart defects. And she had the Classic Fontan at the age of 12, in 1985. Just over a year ago, she received a heart transplant. Her donor was a 29-year-old woman who was a hepatitis C positive intravenous drug user. And Leslie had to take a case study drug to avoid contracting the virus. Leslie had a very bumpy road to recovery with multiple complications involving her brain, heart, and lungs and required procedures after the transplant to alleviate a brain bleed and drain fluid from her lungs. Fortunately, today Leslie is doing well and she is here to talk to us about her early life growing up with a heart defect and how she feels as a survivor with a new heart. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, Leslie Castro. Thank you for having me, Anna. Well, I am certainly happy to have a woman like you with such a complicated medical history on the show because you have such a success story. So let's talk about when you got your Fontan, 12 years of age. You have to have some memories of that. Why don't you tell me about having that operation? I actually had very vivid memories. I can remember basically everything. (laughs) I was supposed to have my classic Fontan in March 1985. However, at the time, my doctor Dr. Ralph Seavers had to go on vacation or was sick. So it got bumped to May of 1985. A week before March, the scheduled first date, my mother sat me down in their bedroom to explain to me that I was going to have a very long heart procedure. And she didn't know what to expect from it. But she's like, we're going to go to Pittsburgh Children's again, and we're going to go through this. And at the time... As a 12-year-old, I said, there's no reason for me to have surgery. I'm perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with me. I am just fine the way I am. The reason I'm laughing, Leslie, is that my son said exactly the same thing to me when he had to have a Fontan revision. Yes. He was like, Mom, I'm fine. (laughs) Oh, yes. And so, you know, from that experience and then going into the hospital May 5th, And then having surgery on May 7th, the night before the surgery, and all during that day, I went through several tests and also had to watch a cardiac open heart procedure done on video. What? And I walked out. Yes. Wait, you were the very first person who's ever told me this. You were 12 years old and they made you watch? I watched an open heart procedure video. Oh my gosh. Why? I have no idea. Oh, my gosh. And walking out of there, I walked back to the room and I told my mom, I don't ever want to see that movie ever again. It scared the crap out of me. Well, yeah. (laughs) But not only that, sometime after the video and, and talking to my mother, I was in a room with four patients at the time before the Fontan. And one of the patient's fathers said, oh, you're going to get a zipper like mine, opened his shirt up and showed me his zipper. Mind you, I never seen any man other than my father, you know, without a shirt. And I'm like, oh, no, Uh, that's what I'm going to look like. Oh, my heart fell. You were a single ventricle patient, didn't you have a lactosic shunt or? I did. So did, I did you not already have a zipper? I did have a zipper, but it wasn't like it was observable per se. It's right underneath my armpit and it goes oh. right underneath. And that's the way they had it done back in the 
or at least yeah. Days. yeah, I've actually talked to some other people who had it over there. So you didn't have the midline zipper. Correct. That's a very impressionable age. It was impressionable. I never really considered my first surgery scar very noticeable. Right. And so when I had the classic Fontan and saw that man open up his shirt and show me his zipper, I was mortified. Sure. Extremely mortified. Sure. Later on that evening, the Dr. Ralph Severs came in the room and my mother was sleeping on an air mattress because in the 1970s, 1980s, they didn't have a portable bed for the parents. They didn't have anything, just seating. My mother was very lucky to get a air mattress. I'm shocked that, that they evening. gave her an air mattress because when my son had surgery, we weren't allowed to stay with our children. They didn't want you staying overnight. But this particular case, since I was one of the first classic Fontan patients out of Pittsburgh Children's, they allowed my mother to be there and my father to be there. And they gave my mother an air mattress to sleep on. Wow. And Dr. Ralph Severs came in and he's like, I don't want to wake your mother. I need to talk to you. And by that time, you know, I already seen the movie and I saw the guy. He's like, don't worry. You're in the best of hands. We're going to do this together and you're going to come out of this surgery pretty much perfect. <laughs> Was that encouraging to you? Yes, because later on, I've talked to Dr. Ralph Severs via phone, via email, and he always encouraged me. But he knew by doing that, it helped me go further, take the next step and the next day to motivate me throughout life. So I'm curious, when that man opened up his shirt, did you burst into tears? My mouth dropped and I was like, oh, that's not what I want to see. Yeah. I was just wondering if how the doctor knew that it was a good idea to come in and reassure you, because it sounds like he was very sympathetic to that. He was very sympathetic, man. And for whatever reason, he reassured me in every way, shape and form that everything was going to be okay and that he had things under control. The next morning, around 5.30, 6 o'clock, the nurses came in. They had a horse needle, literally, and they jabbed the horse needle into my left leg and said, w wiggle your toes, wiggle your toes, wiggle your toes. Meanwhile, this horse needle is very long and the pain that you endure while wiggling your toes is unbearable for a child to go through. And then again, another horse needle in the other thigh and wiggle your toes, wiggle your toes, wiggle your toes. And after I had the medication put in my thighs, I was rolled off into the hallway and into the operating room. When I went into the operating room, the anesthesiologist said, Leslie, what would you like to do after you come out of this surgery? I said, I want to be like my sister, to be able to run, to be able to do things like a normal person. And also, because my favorite team is the Steelers, to the, be the best running back like Franco Harris that I can possibly be. <laughs> <laughs> so she's like, okay, you're going to do that. And at that time, they didn't know what to expect sure. after the Fontan. So whatever they could do to motivate me, to get me through that surgery. So basically, that encouragement to get that far helped me go through the surgery. When I got out of surgery, they gave me a mirror in the ICU room. And in the ICU room, there were about 20 patients, 15 to 20 patients in the ICU room, and closed in by curtains. Mm -hmm. And they gave me the mirror and they said, Leslie, go ahead and look at yourself now in the mirror and see what's happened. And I looked at myself and I said, I don't want to see this again because all I saw in the past was my purple lips and my identity. And to see the change from not having purple lips or purple fingers or purple toes to seeing a normal lips and extremities, it was mind blowing for a 12 year old. Yeah. At that point, I was like, oh no, I'm never going to be able to do anything because I felt I was normal with my purple lips, with my purple fingers and my purple toes. But you told the anesthesiologist you wanted to be like your sister and your sister didn't I did. have purple lips or purple toes. 
she didn't, but it was an identity issue from what I felt was normal, Mm -hmm. per se, as far as my looks, Mm -hmm. not as far as the physical. I mean, running and jumping and doing the activities portion Mm -hmm. of it all. It was more Mm self-image. And so by that time, I had problems eating. They sent a psychologist because I wasn't eating at all. And Dr. Ralph Severs came in again. And he said, why are you not eating? And I said, because my parents had told me that they were going to get me my first Big Mac, my first Coca-Cola, and my first McDonald's French fries in my entire life. So I was expecting that. They told me if I had surgery that I would get that first and foremost. So that was my expectation. And as far as eating, no, I needed to have my first Big Mac, French fries, and (laughs) Coke. (laughs) And that they needed to follow through (laughs) on their promise. Boy, nothing wrong with your memory after that surgery. (laughs) No. And he's like, okay, get her a Big Mac, fries, and Coke down the street. And he goes, if they get you it, Leslie, you better eat everything. And I said, I will. And I certainly ate every bite. Home Tonight Forever by the Baby Blue Sound Collective. I think what I love so much about this CD is that some of the songs were inspired by the patients. Many listeners will understand many of the different songs and what they've been inspired by. Our new album will be available on iTunes, Amazon.com, Spotify. I love the fact that the proceeds from this CD are actually going to help those with congenital heart defects. Enjoy the music. Home Tonight Forever. This content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The opinions expressed in the podcast are not those of Hearts Unite the Globe, but of the hosts and guests, and are intended to spark discussion about issues pertaining to congenital heart disease or bereavement. You are listening to Heart to Heart with Anna. If you have a question or comment that you would like addressed on our show, please send an email to Anna Jaworski at Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. That's Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. Now, back to Heart to Heart with Anna. Leslie, before the break, we learned a little bit about your heart surgery. I am flabbergasted. I have never heard of anybody having to watch a video. I think I might have fainted if I would have had to watch an open heart surgery at 12. Heck, I think I would faint today if I had to watch an open heart surgery. So, wow, that is really quite an experience that you had, not to mention the horse needles in your thighs. I can't even imagine at 12 having to go through that. It must have really, really been scary for you. It was very eye-opening. Yeah. I grew up fast at that point. You did. You were 12 years old when you had this. We said earlier that that's a very impressionable age. I know for me, 12 and 13, those were really important years. How did your heart defect impact your life when you were in middle school? When I went back to school the following school year, which I was in seventh grade, I was very sick. I had ditch toxicity. So by having ditch toxicity, I ended up throwing up in front of friends and friends that I had a crush on. And it was very hard for me to go two weeks to school half a day. I would get sick the first half of the day and having to go home. But eventually, by that time, my friends already knew that I was sick. I went through elementary and middle school with them, and they comforted me. They helped me in any way, shape, or form, and they still do to this day. So you were lucky enough to live in the same place all your early childhood? Correct, yes. So had they seen you with your purple lips, and now all of a sudden you were pink? They did, Did they comment on that? They did, but not so much them, but the students that were coming in new to the district or the teachers. I had a teacher before the Fontan. I told him, hey, I'm going to go and have a cardiac cath and then I'm going to have a Fontan. Well, you're only going to have a cardiac cath and they do that in the arm. And I said, Mm. no, they don't. Well, you don't understand. They do it in the arm. 
And I tried to convince him that they do it in the groin area for children. They strap you down and he didn't want to hear of it. And as well as other teachers, oh, why does she have to spend time in my classroom with her head down? Why does she have to not have other privileges like the other children when it comes to wintertime? I was in the classroom because it was too cold out for me to go out during the fall, during the winter, and I had to be in the classroom. So they had to accommodate. And for me, I did have those comments of purple lips, purple lips, but it didn't affect me as much as the teacher is saying, well, there's no reason for you to put your head down. You're not tired. You're just faking this. You're taking a week off when it's only supposed to be one or two days. You're milking it and you're not tired. So they just really didn't have a clue. They had no clue whatsoever. Do you think that the other kids felt you got preferential treatment in school? Sometimes I think they thought that. But for the most part, because I had a close-knit group of friends, Mm -hmm. I came with a graduating class of 150, all of which I still talk to today. That's cool. When I went through the whole process, and even now, for the last portion of it all, they're still with me. Yeah, so it sounds like the kids understood you better than the grown-ups did. (laughs) In some ways, yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they were the ones that helped me do the activities. They were the ones that motivated me. You can do this. Come on. You can play kickball. You can do jump roping. They helped me as far as my siblings, even walking down to the bus during winter weather. Yeah. So I guess you can understand the importance and the significance of 504 plans and IEP plans where each student is evaluated independently, individually, and they're not expected to be lumped in with all of the other kids and expected to do what everybody else does. Yes, I do. The 504 plan started in 1973. However, in rural communities, it wasn't really enforced. My mother was one of the forefront parents to help put things in place for me, as well as other students in my district. Mm -hmm. For example, as far as getting on the bus, it took 15 minutes. She needs 15 minutes to be able to get on the bus. You have to wait for her 15 minutes. She has to put her head down. She's still going to listen to you, but she has to put her head down. She's tired. She's going to listen to everything you're saying. She does very well in class, but she needs that rest time. If she doesn't feel well and she feels extremely tired, she can go to the nurse's office for five or 10 minutes. And then field trips. I have to go to these field trips with her until the point where I'm like, wait a second, mom, you're not going on the next field trip. I'm doing it myself. <laughs> but <laughs> good for you, Leslie. But good for your mom, too. She recognized that maybe they would try and rush you through and you might not be able to keep up. She wanted to be there just in case something like that would happen. Right. And they actually wanted to hold me back in sixth grade Mm -hmm. during the Fontan. And my mother was like, no, you were supposed to provide a tutor, which you didn't. My daughter has excellent grades and she showed them proof, the principal and the superintendent. Look, you were supposed to implement all these things for her to achieve and to go on with her friends to the next grade. And you missed something somewhere. My daughter is not going to be in the same grade with her sister because my sister and I were a year and a half apart. That's not going to happen. Your mom was your champion. Yes. She made sure that I knew that I had tricuspid atresia pulmonary stenosis. She educated me and my father too, as far as nutrition. They brought out nutrition books and you have to read this. And this is how we're going to do it. Whatever Dr. Park says, this is what we're going to do. Or Dr. Bierman or Dr. Jay Fricker. This is our plan and we're going to stick to it. Anna Jaworski has written several books to empower the congenital heart defect or CHD community. These books can be found at Amazon.com or at her website, www.babyheartspress.com. Her bestseller is The Heart of a Mother, an anthology of stories written by women for women in the CHD community. Anna's other books, My Brother Needs an Operation, The Heart of a Father, and Hypoplastic Left Heart Syndrome, 
a handbook for parents, will help you understand that you are not alone. Visit babyheartspress.com to find out more. Heart to Heart with Anna is a presentation of Hearts Unite the Globe and is part of the Hug Podcast Network. Hearts Unite the Globe is a nonprofit organization devoted to providing resources to the congenital heart defect community to uplift, empower, and enrich the lives of our community members. If you would like access to free resources pertaining to the CHD community, please visit our website at www.congenitalheartdefects.com for information about CHD, the hospitals that treat children with CHD, summer camps for CHD survivors, and much, much more. Leslie, let's start this segment by talking about something that can be really difficult to talk about, and that is survivor's guilt. How have you been plagued by survivor's guilt in your life? In 1997 to 1998, I tried to find more and more information about my heart disease. By doing this, I came across some patients that were from Pittsburgh Children's Hospital that had single ventricles. And because of this, I became friends with them, one of them. And then in 1998, I started having arrhythmias. And I went in the Children's Hospital and my nurse came in. She looked at my chart and she went back outside. She looked at my chart again, went back outside, looked my chart again. And by the third time, I said, you know... If you go outside of that room again and not tell me why you're continuously looking at my chart, you're not going to be my nurse. And she's like, I'm sorry, but we're the same. I said, what? Well, we're the same. We have tricuspid atresia pulmonary stenosis. We had the same doctors. We had the same cardiac surgeon. We had the same, basically everything, the team. And we became very good friends. Your nurse had exactly the same heart condition you had? Correct. Correct. So why was she going in and out of your room? She was nervous because she never, ever saw another patient like herself. Oh, wow. Because back in the 1970s and 1980s, it was all hush-hush. If we Mm -hmm. talked about our congenital heart disease with another patient, Leslie, get to your room. Or what are you talking about? You know, if they heard us, it wasn't like you could talk to another group. Our parents could, but as far as patient to patient... No. Wow. The next time I went to the hospital, I had the same nurse. But this time, the doctor, this cardiac surgeon, was in the hallway, and he saw her, and he saw me talking with her. Mm -hmm. And his mouth dropped. He was amazed because he knew that we were going to end up to be lifelong friends. As the years went by, we had the same surgeries and the same doctors in different cities in 2000. 17, she was denied a transplant. Oh, no. In the same hospital that I had my transplant. Oh, my goodness, Leslie. Yeah. Why was she denied? She had, I think it was a liver cirrhosis. I want to say cardiac cirrhosis, but she also had some other complications as well. Oh, sweetie. It was very detrimental to my self esteem because. We had the same doctors, the same surgeons, the same operations, and I was crushed. Yeah, you were like heart sisters. We were heart twins. Yeah. In 2017, I went to her wake. I knew her sister, her husband. We knew each other prior to her wake. Mm -hmm. And my heart twin and I had agreed upon that I would return to Pittsburgh for the transplant. Oh, so she was supportive of you getting a transplant, even oh, though she, she was, was denied for it. one. <laughs> she oh. was for it. Even before then, you know, we right. had it all planned out since 2004. Oh. And so <laughs> wow. if one of us was to go, that we'd, she made sure that I came back home, basically, so to speak, if something would happen to me. Wow. Wow. So I followed with her wishes. And in the process, I went through, you know, the cardiac casts and the evaluations. Her sister and her husband were there the whole way oh, through. Oh, my gosh. The whole way through. Uh, Leslie, you're going to make me cry. Through the transplant. Oh. And even afterwards. And to this day, still call me. Wow. That's a beautiful story. But I understand. It's a bittersweet story, isn't it? It is. And not only that, when I was in the hospital, I spent four months in the hospital waiting for the transplant. Two months before and then two months after. 
right across the hallway was another Dr. Ralph Seavers patient, a single ventricle. And he also was denied a transplant. He needed a heart, liver, and kidney. Wow. So I had to go through one who had a transplant in Florida, and she made it one week and passed away in 2004. Then my friend, my very, very close friend, my heart twin, who was denied heart and liver, more than likely, in 2017. And then again, my friend who passed away in June of this year. Wow. Yeah. So it was very important for me to talk about them and to also make it through the transplant. Yeah. Because you weren't just doing it for Leslie. I wasn't doing it for me. I was doing it for everyone, their families. And it was a big, big ordeal for me to make it through everything. And I mean everything. Yeah. Wow. That's a lot to go through. What brings you joy having experienced all of this? It brings me joy to be able to tell everybody my experience with survivor's guilt, with single ventricle, and one of the older single ventricles at a Pittsburgh Children's Hospital. And also having had the transplant and a hep C donor heart, and to be able to be alive to even share my experience, because most don't have that opportunity. That's true. You realize just how blessed you are, don't you? Right. So what advice do you have for others who might be in a situation like you've been in? Some of the things that I've done in the past, I would think twice before doing it. Can you be specific? As far as alcohol, Mm. I drank a lot in college years and uh, after college years. Had I known about liver disease, I probably wouldn't have drank as much as I did or probably would have done things a little bit differently. So you would think twice before you drank as much. What other advice would you give for people who might have a single ventricle heart, might have a Fontan, and might also be looking at transplants sometime in their future? I would also suggest second opinion and third opinion, and even fourth if there was an opportunity, because I was denied, I think it was three, two or three times prior to being on the list for a heart and liver. At first, Mm -hmm. I was denied in D.C. and then denied in Presbyterian Hospital and then denied, but basically because of more testing, liver evaluations. And then the third time I was finally on the list. Wow. Third or fourth time I was on the list. So you need to be persistent. Is that what you're saying? Like? Extremely <laughs> persistent. And, and they know in P- Presbyterian, they called me the feisty one. <laughs> so. And I bet your mother and your dad were there and they were a little feisty too. They this time were more mellow as far as going through the process again. Uh, they left it all up to me. And wow. because I had the 20 years, I went through the Fontan revision and my sister was my medical power of attorney. Uh-huh. And mainly my parents took a back seat, but they were also able to speak up if need be. Mm-hmm. Mainly it was the two of us. Plus also my heart twin sister who was in the medical field and my cousin who was also there for the transplant It sounds like you had a lot of support. You had a great support system, not to mention the angels watching over you. Yes, I did. And that's one of the other things that you have to have during the transplant, whether it be heart or any other organ, you have to have a good support system. Absolutely. Well, I'm so glad that you have made it through and that you've been willing to share your very inspirational story. Thank you so much for coming on the program today, Leslie. Thank you for having me. Well, that's it for this week's episode, my friends. If you enjoyed this episode of Heart to Heart with Anna, please take a moment and leave a review on whatever platform you use to listen to our program. And remember, my friends, you are not alone. Thank you again for joining us this week. We hope you have been inspired and empowered to become an advocate for the congenital heart defect community. Heart to Heart with Anna, with your host, Anna Jaworski, can be heard every Tuesday at 12 noon Eastern Time.